wrapping up our series through Daniel, talking about being an unshakable people. And so uh, if you'll turn to Daniel chapter 12, uh, we are just going to be there very briefly. There's a lot of information that happens between Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 12. And it's pretty much impossible in order to cover it all. Not only that, but I don't want you to be bored out of your minds, okay? <laughs> because there's a lot of history and uh, some of the things can be very confusing. But basically to summarize for you, Daniel has this vision, this dream, in which he sees his people once again under persecution. And he sees this king of the north fighting against the king of the south, and the Jewish people get caught up in the mix, and it's really not a very enjoy, uh, enjoying dream to have. And so once again, Daniel sees chaos for his people, but through chaos is God's providence. Through chaos is God's perseverance. Through chaos is God's people winning. That's the main idea. And the most important part of Daniel chapter 12 is Daniel's testimony and the testimony of the people of God throughout their time of persecution. And I would say that's the same thing for us, is that we have highs and lows. We win, we lose. We have successes and we have failures. But at the end of the day, the most important thing for every person in this room is our testimony. The testimony of this church, the testimony of our lives. And so Daniel's big point is shine bright like the stars of heaven. As you live your life, as you end your days, make sure you shine. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about, shining bright like the stars. Me personally, I have a really good relationship with the stars of the sky. I was actually grown up, my father taught me uh, through telescopes, and my parents were split up in divorce, and so I went and lived with my dad earlier on in kindergarten. I only lived with him for a very short period of time, but one of the fond memories I have of sharing that time with my dad and living with him is that we got to look at the stars at night. My dad had this really old telescope, and if you could picture it like this, you would look out at our house from the front, and we had kind of a small house up front, but it actually had a basement underneath, which made it really, really big. And it was a walkout basement with a garage on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side was a carport that you could pull up under. And so you could step outside or you could step underneath and you'd be protected from the, uh, from the elements. Well, on the back side of that carport, there was a gigantic opening. It didn't have a back wall. And so my dad would set the telescope up right there, and he would put chairs down, and we would drink hot cocoa, and we would just look at the stars, and he would show us the planets. And it was a really, really good time. And so I've always remembered that, and I wish I still had my dad's telescope, but I'll have to buy a new one, and maybe one day I'll be able to do that with my kids as well. But looking at stars has kind of a, a majestic uh, feeling to it. You know what I mean? Does anybody put a star on their Christmas tree? Anybody? We have an angel. We did an angel the last couple of years, uh, which isn't a real angel, but it's an angel that we all know. But we used to do a star every year, a gigantic star on the top. And stars are really cool. And so stars had this association with the people of God. Uh, in fact, we know Jesus' birth is uh, remembered by what? A bright star over Bethlehem. And so after this incredible testimony and this terrible dream that Daniel has, Daniel gets this encouragement from the angel in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Daniel receives this encouragement which says this, Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In other words, Daniel, those who lead righteous lives, those who walk in wisdom are going to shine like the stars of heaven. And so the first point that I'd like to talk to you about tonight is that what does it mean to shine bright like the stars? What does it mean to have a good testimony? Well, first and foremost, it means to be rational. To be rational. Sometimes we make decisions based off of our emotion. Our stomach is actually called our second brain. And a lot of times it's our stomach that gets us into a lot of trouble, right? A lot of you know what I'm talking about. When you are upset and you are angry and you make emotional-based decisions, nine times out of ten, those aren't probably really good decisions that you make. We say things like this, well, I wouldn't have said that if I was so angry. Or I wouldn't have acted that way if I would have just listened to my mind instead of my emotions. And so the Bible talks about this idea of rational living or, or living like wise people. And there's something to be said for a person who has been able to hone in their skill to live skillfully. That's, that's really what wisdom means. It means to live skillfully, to be wise. And so knowing what to say and when to say it, 
Knowing when to speak and, and when not to speak. Knowing when to do something or not do something is really the art of living. You know, sometimes uh, I'll wake up because for whatever reason, I've been having to use the restroom early in the morning now. It's really annoying. Before I could go like 16 hours, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but now I can't even make it through the night. And so I get up and uh, I, I, I like to sleep in the dark. It's not how I used to be, um, but I, that's my preference. Well, Angel, she actually likes to leave lights on when she sleeps. It's terrible. I'll come into the bedroom, she'll be asleep. There's two lamps on. I'm like, how is this even possible? So... There's usually, you know, no, uh, there's usually lamps on. Well, one night I woke up, there was absolutely no lamps on, and so I'm starting to walk around the room, and we ended up getting a new, uh, it's not a treadmill, but it's uh, something that you pull, what do they call those things? Yeah, yeah, a rower, that's it. And so I'm getting up, walking around, we just got a rower, cracked my toe right on the edge of the bed. I did not curse, okay? I did not curse. But here's the thing, the whole point of navigating through the dark is that you don't know where you're going. You get hurt. You make mistakes. When you flip on the light, you can see. That's the point of having a testimony. That's the point of shining bright like a star, is that you live in such a way where people can see God. And what is being told to Daniel through this passage of Scripture is, Daniel, things are going to be tough. The people are going to go through a lot of persecution. But your testimony matters because what you do can bring glory to God. Jesus put it like this in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of of the world. You are here to shine. And so the wisest among us will walk in the light, not in the darkness. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 with me. Paul is writing this passage of scripture to um, the church at Ephesus, and they have lived a life of darkness. Ephesus had a terrible reputation for sexual morality. Uh, it was just not a very good place to live. And so a lot of the Christians that they gathered into this church had a lot of baggage. They lived their lives in the dark. They did things that we would consider today very, very dark and disgusting. And so Paul writes to these Christians who have been converted, and he reminds them of this. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, he says, you were formerly walking in the darkness. You were formerly of the dark, but now you are of the light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So what is the fruit or the outcome of a person who is walking in the light like the stars of the heaven? We will have good deeds, in other words. If you are walking in darkness, the things that you do, the things that you think, the things that you uh, believe in will reflect the type of person that you are. You will think dark thoughts. You will have dark feelings. You will have dark action. But Paul says that's who you used to be. Now you need to shine bright, and the reflection of a bright shining star is learning to do and live and act according to the righteous deeds that God wants us uh, to perform. And so here's the first thing that he lists off of, that he lists off. First of all, Daniel said, the, the, the shining stars will have righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous? It means to reflect the right things of God, to be on his side. To be righteous means to do things God's way to make decisions and have thoughts that align with God's character. And so how in the world can you figure out what to do, what's right and wrong? Well, you have to read in the Bible, look at the inspired scripture, learn about God, who he is, how he acts, and then respond accordingly. But Daniel said righteousness, and Paul adds two things, goodness and truth. Goodness means to be benevolent. It, it's the opposite of being vicious. You know, when, some, when you say, man, that is just a good person, he is just a good guy. Generally speaking, you will say, this person generally does good things. He's not a very vicious person. He's not vindictive. He looks out for the best interests of others. And so goodness is not simply something that you do. Goodness is something that you are. It is a disposition. And it is a disposition that leads to good works, having integrity, justice. He also says we should be people of truth. Not just doing the right things, not just being a good person, but having and believing in the truth, revering it, speaking it, acting according to it, being sincere and honest and not false. To walk in the light of the truth means to oppose error and lies and hypocrisy. 
I had some dysfunction when I was growing up. As I said, my parents were divorced. I have some great memories. I was raised in the church for the most part. I, I did wander away. But one of the dysfunctions that I developed was being a passive-aggressive person. And so the way that we would keep the peace is to ignore the obvious. Any of you like that? Right? You don't bring up what bothers you. You don't bring up what hurts you. You just want people to go along and get along. And so you don't ever bring up conflict. You just keep the peace. Well, what happens? One embittered feeling, one angry emotion, it starts to boil up. And then you have an explosion, <laughs> right? And so one of the dysfunctions that I had to overcome in my childhood was learning to speak the truth in love, to deal with truth saying what needs to be said, but doing it in such a way that shines bright, that glorifies God. And so that's what Paul's encouraging us to do here. Don't just try to keep the peace by ignoring the obvious or not dealing with, with what is true. Keep the peace by speaking the truth. That is what it means to shine bright. That's what it means to live a uh, skillful living and, and live like God wants us to live. Look what else he says in Ephesians 5, verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. We need to be careful. This means to live with diligence. Another way to think of it is walk with your eyes open, right? You've got obstacles that are in your path. You stub your toe on certain things. But when you can see, when you shine the light, when you're aware, that's what it means to live skillfully. That's what God wanted for Daniel. That's what God wanted for the people of Daniel. Tough times are coming, and here's how you need to live. Shine the light, the word of God, a, a, a vibrant prayer life, rejoicing in the things of truth. Jesus said this in John chapter 12. He says, he told his disciples, for a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light. He's speaking about himself so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. Do you ever feel like you're wandering through life aimlessly? Have you ever felt like you don't know what your purpose is, you don't know what you're going, you don't know what you're supposed to do? Well, the Bible is emphatically clear. Without Jesus at the center, without having a foundation of morality and truth and justice, your life is aimless, ultimately. It is purposeless. And so Jesus says that we must walk with rules of principles that guide our actions, and that's exactly what the light does. Think of it like this, right? The uh, Winter Olympics is not too far away, and so you have athletes who have been training themselves, and they don't just approach the Winter Games by chance. It's not some type of lottery system. What do they do? They have diligence, self-discipline. They keep the goal in the forefront of their mind. And so if we are going to walk like radiant stars, if we are going to shine bright, we have to keep that type of attitude in the forefront of our mind. He says, don't be as wise men in Ephesians 5. Uh, don't, not like the, the unwise men, but the wise. And so the question to you this morning is, if you are going to shine bright like the stars of heaven, if you are going to give God the glory with your life, you need to be following somebody who is wise, somebody who can lead you down that path. And here's the question. Who are you following? Who have you learned after? What type of characteristics, ideas, thoughts, patterns of behavior are you following? And I can promise you this. If it isn't Jesus, you're missing the point. If Jesus is not the number one influencer on your life and your decisions and your attitudes, you need to reconsider who you're following. You see, we are all following someone. There is a person that you follow, whether consciously or subconsciously, consciously. the question is who? Who is guiding you down the path of, of, of being a wise person, living skillfully? He says, make the most of your time. When you shine bright like the stars of heaven and you live in wisdom, make the most of your time. It means to catch the opportunity to escape difficulty. Think of it like this. How many of you, if you got contacted by the IRS and they said, look, we're going to exempt you from taxes this year, right? You get to escape the difficulty of paying us thousands of dollars. How many of you would take advantage of that? Dude, I'd be jumping on it like, you know what, you know what I'm saying? I would be making phone calls, I'd be showing up at the office, I'm like, I hate taxes, I don't want to pay them, I do it because it's the right thing to do, but if I've got a way out, if I can escape this thing, I'm going to seize that opportunity, right? 
That's what God wants us to do by making the most of our time. You don't want to pass up a bargain. And so ultimately, Daniel was to live his life in such a way that when he looks at the end, and he can see the difficulty coming ahead, and he says, I'm going to seize the opportunity by escaping it. How so? By living according to the wisdom of God. That's the point. And so why, living wisely certainly comes at a challenge because when you know what you ought to do, what do you have to do? You, you need to do it, right? I mean, if you can look at the future and you can see the disaster, you can see the persecution, you can see the trouble, the whole point of living skillfully is to avoid that or to take advantage of a good opportunity. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Here's the second thing that Daniel's told. He says, throughout this time, many will be purged and purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will even understand. I think that's probably, and, and I can attest to this because I was there, that's probably the, the most tragic part about living outside of God and in your sin is that you really can't even see it. You really don't even know it. You're not even aware of it. You just act wickedly. You, you don't even think anything different. He says, but those who have insight will understand. And so it's not enough just to know the wisdom, but we have to act according to the wisdom. In other words, it's not enough just to be rational and understand, but we must be radiant. We must shine. We must put the wisdom to the test. We must apply it. And so we shouldn't just think about how we ought to live, but we need to follow through with it. Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, Rick, I get it. I need to shine bright like the stars of heaven. I need to have a testimony that brings glory to God. How do I do that? Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. It means to consider the end before you act. It develops a healthy respect of fear, doesn't it? I mean, if you know 100% that this is going to cause you to have cancer... How should that dictate your actions? You would avoid it, right? If you know without a shadow of a doubt that if you do this good thing, you will reap the reward, you will have the benefit, what should you do? Act accordingly. If you know that God is going to win and you know that you have the opportunity to spend eternity in life with him, that should dictate your actions. If you know that sin brings death and separation between you and God, we should avoid it, right? Are you with me? And so that's what Paul's instructing us to do. I would hate for God to return and to find me living unfaithfully, to take that risk, to have that chance. To live in darkness is not even close to worth living an eternal life with God. Let me show you a few scriptures uh, up on the screen that Proverbs has the, this idea of living with fear, which is the beginning, beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1, seven: the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you want to learn how you ought to live, start with developing a healthy respect and a fear for God. The fear of the Lord will cause one to hate evil. The fear of the Lord will prolong one's life. The fear of the Lord prompts one to depart from evil. The fear of the Lord leads to a satisfying life. It spares you from much evil. I mean, over and over again, this idea of respecting God and what he has set out and what he has told us to do, it enables us to live a better life. One of the reasons why I give to God is because I'm afraid that God disciplines those whom he loves. And so if I don't give back to God, I know that God is going to teach me a very hard lesson. It's the truth. That's how he operates. God loves me enough than to allow me to idolize my money. I know that if I'm not diligent in serving the Lord, I know that God's going to teach me a lesson. I know that he'll take away more of my time rather than giving it back to me. God loves us. He disciplines us. And so if I'm a wise person and I see the consequences of my sin, most certainly I should be aware and act accordingly. And that's exactly what the people of God needed in this moment. They needed the knowledge that would enable them to act wisely through some of the most difficult times in life. One of the most difficult times in life came to me, embarrassingly, but I'm going to share it with you anyways. So uh, I am not the master mechanic or constructioner, if that makes sense, or even speaker or preacher. But every once in a while, I like to try to take on projects 
Uh, I just built this fireplace. Uh, it's just not anything special or anything. <clears throat> not bragging or nothing. But uh, I built this fireplace in our living room, and we put an electric insert in there. And it was, it's really cool. I'm really proud of myself. Pat on the back for me. Yay, Rick's awesome. But uh, when I first started out figuring out how to do anything with tools, any construction worker will tell you, anytime you deal with saws, you need to be very careful, right? Table saws, miter saws, sawzalls, jigsaws, whatever. So uh, I'm like, dude, I need to do this project. I'm running the speaker system, and I had to cut through this two by four. And so, uh, and so I decided to take this reciprocating saw, and I'm just going to make two cuts, one down the other. So I bought this really cheap saw, which is a piece of junk. But anyways, so the first time that I'm ever cutting this wood and using this saw, I remember my grandfather, who was really good at construction work. He did it his entire life. He made fun of me when I tried to help him. Really encouraging. That's, that's the kind of life I grew up with. And, uh, yeah, I'm serious. It's, he's made fun of me all the time. It's because I was terrible. <laughs> I bent like 50 nails in one day. It was awful. Anyways, sorry, I was distracted. Squirrel. But, so, I'm cutting down through this wood. Well, he told me, when you use a reciprocating saw, you have to watch because the front of the blade sometimes will hit and it kicks back. And if you're not careful, it could, you could drop it, it could cut you. And so all I'm thinking in my mind is, you know, holding this thing and making sure it doesn't kick back. And so I cut down through one side. Well, because I'm spectacular, this was a long time ago, okay? Not like last week or anything. Because, you're not laughing, that's okay. So this was a long time ago. So I'm cutting down through, and I notice the blade is really bent, so I can't get a, a, a nice straight cut. And so without even thinking about it, I reach my hand up to turn the blade back. Yeah, some of you actually know what's, what's going to happen. And it is super red hot. But I'm so overconfident and determined. It's like, you know, when you watch Home Alone and the guy's downstairs and he takes the electrical water because he's got paint all over him and he sits there and he shakes. That's almost what it was like. And so I try to turn that blade back, burnt my hand, but I just kind of held it because I wasn't really sure what was going on. I mean, a complete fool because I had no idea what I was doing, right? That's the idea. Well, do the opposite of that <laughs> when it comes to living skillfully and, and doing the things that God wants us to do. And so now I think twice before I ever will touch a blade after cutting with it again. You learn your lessons the hard way, right? Man, life is such a good teacher. I was actually at Ken Moore's shop, had to get uh, tires replaced. And you can tell Ken is a wise guy. He has seen and done a lot of things. Uh, he's had good mechanics and bad mechanics. And so I'm there, and he's down a guy, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, hey, Ken, man, if you know, if you ever need somebody to go in the back and help you out, even on my own vehicle, you know, I'll be happy to go back there and do it. And Ken kind of looks down. He's, he's our elder here. And he goes, without, like, no filter, he goes, man, is that a scary thought? <laughs> it's true. It's such a scary thought. I mean, what a bad decision to put somebody like me in the back working on even my own vehicle, let alone somebody else's. And so I'm like, I've laughed all the way home thinking about that. Ken is wise. He knows what's going on. You know what I mean? He gets it. And so I volunteer for stuff around the church. Hey, I'll fix it. And I just get total silence from the elders. I'm like, hey, I did my job. You know what I'm saying? No, it was, it was pretty funny. But that is, the, that is the idea of shining bright like the stars of heaven. The idea of being a radiant light is not only learning how to live, but then applying it and not living foolishly. And so what God instructs us to do is he's telling Daniel, he says, Daniel, many are going to be purged, many are going to be refined, but I win. God's people will win. And so this idea of being purged and refined, if you can think of it like this, it's like gold. Gold, when you refine it and you put it in fire, it burns off the impurities and it separates the gold from the other metals. And that's what we are to undergo. Our faith, our life is refined and purged through tribulation and trials. There's no way around it. You will suffer in this life. That's what the Bible promises. Peter put it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in what? What do stars do? Praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Jews were going to suffer something terrible, but it was their perseverance that was going to result in God being praised. Thank God for the Jews like Maccabees. Thank God for the celebration of Hanukkah. Thank God for those things because without their perseverance, Jesus would not have been born in Bethlehem. 
You see, the Christian life is a state of un, uh, excuse me, is a state of healthy tension between law and grace. You know, sometimes you're just like, man, I wish I could just rest. But you have to have a new type of rest. You enable God's grace to give you hope and peace and patience, knowing that God forgives you, but that God wants you to become better. You know that God has given you salvation and wiped away your sins, but he doesn't want you to stay the person that you were yesterday. That is the healthy tension. Pushing forward to become better and brighter for God, but knowing that God has given you your salvation. And here's the cool thing. When the Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, you can't work out something that you don't already have. That's the idea of God's grace. God has given you salvation. It is a free gift that you receive by grace, through faith, in baptism. But God wants you to work towards holiness and and purge your sins and purge the imperfections in your faith. Philippians 2.13 puts it like this. For God is at work in you, both to his will and to work his pleasure. And so it's through this refinement, it's through this tribulation, it's through this chaos that God's beauty and light is made known. And when we live in a healthy dose of fear and trembling, we will find one of the most spectacular, amazing, counterintuitive things will ever happen. We will have peace. Doesn't everybody want that? Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Christmas is a time of peace, not war. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Can we just be at peace? But it is only through the chaos can we reach that peace. It's only through confronting and speaking truth to yourself can you reach that peace. It's only through thinking things through wisely. It's only through acting radiantly can we reach this point of being ready, being ready for God. That's the whole point of the book of Daniel, was to prepare the Jewish people for what they were getting ready to endure. Not only a momentary persecution, but an eternal glory with God. Daniel finishes it out like this. See, Daniel was very upset. Uh, He was very disturbed at these dreams that he saw because he he saw the the terrible nature of it. But in Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, it says this. But as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into your rest and you will rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Daniel, this bad stuff's going to happen. It's for my purpose and my plan. It's for the radiant stars of God's people to shine brightly and for people to give me glory. But you will find rest. Remember, Daniel was almost 90 years old. He had lived such a challenging life. Even up to the very point of his life, he was receiving what the future was going to have in store. But God's message for Daniel was this. Have peace. Be at rest. And so... We see Olympic athletes, they train their entire lives, they discipline themselves, they sweat, they cry, they bleed. But man, when they get to the game, they're not worried about their training. They're not worried about what not to do or what to do. They've conditioned themselves in such a way that they are ready. That's the idea of this life, to work yourself in such a way that you are ready. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 44, for this reason you must also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you will not think he will. There's nothing like being ready for Christmas. Am I right, parents? I mean, get the house decorated, buy the presents, wrap the presents, get the cookies baked, get it all out of the way so that you can what? Enjoy the season. I mean, who wants to be at chaos leading up to Christmas Eve, unless you're a dude? You know what I mean? Be like, I got to go get my wife Christmas presents. There's nothing like just being ready and enjoying the season. I mean, isn't that the whole point? Is not to be miserable throughout the Christmas season? I know people that are like, I just can't wait for the holidays to be over. I'm like, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> why, would you, why would you do Christmas that way? I mean, you're miserable. Why are you making yourself miserable? It's because sometimes we lose sight of the, the journey and the process and why we're doing the things that we do. And so making yourself ready doesn't mean making yourself miserable. You've got to learn to love the process. We are told to be rational, to think about the right things, to be radiant, to do things the right way so that we can be ready. But don't make the Christian life miserable. It doesn't have to be. The Christian life can be awesome, amazing, enjoyable. It has its lows, but it certainly has its highs. And let me tell you something. You are going to enjoy the rest of your life in eternity if you put in the hard work now. Paul says it like this. And I think about Christmas time with this passage. He says, 
In Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Anytime Angel complains, she's not in here, so I can say it. I say, uh, do all things without grumbling and complaining, Angel. She's like, yeah, you would try to take that scripture out of context. See, my wife knows the Bible. That's one of the things that attracted me to her. She had like a whole New Testament memorized. She was in Bible Bowl. I was like, man, that is hot. She knows the Bible. <laughs> I could say that too. She's not in here. Her face would be so red. I don't know if she can hear me right now. But to do all things without grumbling or disputing, right? To go through Christmas time, in other words, without grumbling or complaining. To go through this Christian life without grumbling or complaining. And here's the point. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. The whole point of this life is to be a light. And what do lights do? They shine. And they look at the darkness and they put a spotlight on it. And slowly but surely, the light gets bigger and bigger until the darkness is gone. That's what God wants for our personal life, but that's what God wants for the whole world. To grumble means to complain out of selfishness. Here's my complaint because I'm most important. Here's my complaint, because things aren't done my way. That's what it means to grumble. It's a secret displeasure. It's a passive mumble who sneers and sighs and discontent without right or reason. That's what it means to grumble. He says don't dispute. It means don't complain. It means don't just argue about things which only causes confusion. It's a discussion with no progress. It's being willing to offer up a complaint without a solution. You just keep going back and forth. I'm unhappy, I'm unhappy. Here's the problem, here's the problem. It's never saying, here I am. What can I do to solve the issue? Here I am, God. I'm miserable, I'm unhappy. Things aren't going well. What do I need to do myself to bring peace to my own heart and my own life? Here I am, church. Here's what I see, here's what I think. What can I do to be a part of the solution? Not just to complain and grumble and be miserable because we're not meant to be miserable. Not in this Christian life. We're meant to have joy even when we're sad. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And you know, I have to be honest. I can't necessarily blame people for rejecting the Americanized church culture the institutionalism, the structure. Because here's what a lot of people see. They hear about how they need to come to church and be a good person, and they hear the preacher preach on love and acceptance and joy, and the next thing they know, they see the church fight and dispute over programs and carpet colors and music and sound and all the things that don't really matter in this life. If we're supposed to be stars that are bringing God glory, And we get so wrapped up in the materialistic, pathetic, low-life, low-level discussions, divisions that this world has to offer. What kind of life or testimony is that? Shine bright like the stars on heaven cannot happen if God is not glorified. And that is what the Bible wants us to practice. You see, they see arguing and fighting and complaining and Facebook posts and passive-aggressive tweets And they look at the Bible and they say, is this really the church that I read about? Is this the Jesus whom they claim to follow? And so that's ultimately what's at stake. That's what was at stake for Daniel. That's what was at stake for the first church. And that's the same thing that is at stake for us today. And so is your post, your tweet, your text, your speech, your email, your complaint, your action, is it going to bring glory to God? Is it going to put the spotlight on heaven? Or is it going to put the spotlight where it belongs? on Jesus, who is the Christ. And if it doesn't put the spotlight on God, is it worth saying or thinking or doing? That is the ultimate question that only you and you alone can ask. And so we end where we began. It surely is not rational or wise to do something or say something that takes away from the glory of God. And so we have to determine whether or not we are going to live a life that is radiant, that is ready, and that is willing to be a person who walks according to rationality and following God and seeing the end of the means. And God, I want to be there with you. You see, some 2,000 years ago, there was a really cool light that shined in Bethlehem. And these magi, who were very intelligent men, they weren't Jews by any means, 
They traveled from halfway around the known world at that time because they saw a shining light. And they said, this is what God talked about. This was the Messiah, the the Lord, the one who was supposed to come. And so they traveled all this way, and naturally they went to King Herod. Surely somebody like King Herod, who was the king of the Jews, who they waited for the Messiah, surely somebody like him would be longing to see this prophecy come to fulfillment. And so they go to uh, King Herod, and they ask him, they said, hey, where's the Messiah? The star is here. Have you found him? Well, King Herod was very concerned about something, and it wasn't the star shining on God. It was the star shining on himself. And so King Herod devised a plan because he tried to trick the Magi. And because the star was shining in heaven and giving glory to God, King Herod didn't like that. The attention had to be on himself. And so he decided to kill all of the children in Bethlehem, ages three and under. The deadly consequences of a life lived that is selfish and looking upon oneself is catastrophic. That's why it's important to live our lives in such a way that brings glory to God because we don't know the repercussions of our selfishness and our own desires and our own wants. You see, Jesus came to them, but they didn't know it was him. They chose to live in darkness, not only Herod, but the Jews. And so John wrote this after Jesus' life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not even comprehend it. It's a scary thought to think that we could live our lives in such a way that we could be blind to the true meaning of Christmas, that we could be blind to the true meaning of life, that we can allow ourselves to get wrapped up into things that are petty and not even worth our time and lose sight of God. The whole point, that's why we're here. And so this Christmas, I want to encourage you, don't miss out on the meaning of Christmas. Be rational, be radiant and be ready to give God the glory in everything that you say and everything that you do. Will you stand and pray with me? God, we give you thanks for Jesus who was willing to not take away from who he was in eternity, but to add the human flesh to his nature and veil his divine attributes that he would suffer and pour himself out for our sin. God, thank you for Jesus who was a baby willing to humble himself, to love, to speak the truth in love, to bring glory to you, God, even in his flesh. Even when he was God in the flesh, he still pointed to you. Father, for this we give you thanks. We thank you for his example. God, I pray that you will uproot the selfishness in my heart and our hearts. That God, as we live through this Christmas season, as we live our lives, we will do so in such a way that brings honor and glory to you thinking your thoughts, living your life, being the person that you want us to be, God, not getting caught up in the distractions of this life. God, I pray that we will surrender our hearts to you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and sing. Amen. You give life.
Christmas to all of you, and uh, don't forget, uh, 7 o'clock uh, tonight, we're going to have the uh, children's uh, musical, and it will be such an encouragement to them. I know that they've been working hard, singing their heart out, and uh, it's, it's just going to be an awesome thing to be a part of. So just want to encourage you, again, to come out uh, for that tonight at 7 o'clock. Let's close out our service in prayer. Lord, uh, you are great, and you are so good, and Father, we praise you even for the breath in our lungs. God, I pray right now for those who have been hurting, for those who aren't at peace, for those who are discontent, and who feel weary and feel troubled. God, I pray that they will find peace and rest living in the healthy tension of this life, pushing forward but accepting your grace, never giving up but being at peace with who you've made them to be in Christ. Father, I pray that you'll be able to utilize us as your people in this room to bring peace to those around us this Christmas season and that we can help bring people back to reality that through all the Christmas craziness, throughout the busyness of life, at the end of the day, there's only one thing that matters and that's our relationship with you. God, let us be people that speak truth into the lives of those around us, encourage, build each other up, not tear each other down, and that we could be the people that you want us to be so that we can bring glory to you, Lord. We love you. We thank you, and we thank you for Christmas. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.